We're discussing key factors for succeeding with hemp, and today we're talking about uh, in-season preventative practices. Ray, you know, just describe to us what are preventative practices. Preventative practices are part of a, um, really of an overall system to look at called integrated pest management and IPM involves learning what to look for, scouting for those insects, and then understanding their life cycle so that when you do have to implement control measures, then you have a better understanding of ways to control those pests and insects. Insects like to hide. So you're gonna to try to figure out where they live and then look for them early. There's a number of insects that are particularly uh, gnarly pests that if you catch early and you do some preventative sprays uh, and you understand their life cycle, uh, it's more of a one-two punch. And if so, you're scouting this crop very often and early in the cycle, and then you do some beneficial insect releases, then you'll have a clean crop for the rest of the season more than likely. And you know, what role does weed control play in this? Weeds or um, other plants growing in amongst uh, in, uh, your main crop can harbor harmful insects. Uh, they can also trap water and moisture and spread disease as well. So uh, it's general practice, specifically late in the crop cycle, that if you do have weeds in between your rows to keep them as short and mown as possible or removed. What are the mitigation uh, practices for certain diseases? There's a number of ways that you can control disease that are more of a, um, a, a method and approach of preventing the conditions that create these disease problems, like watering late in the day and having the plants be wet at night. That's, that's gonna increase your problems. Uh, the other uh, ways to, to prevent diseases is understanding your environment and spacing your plants further apart for airflow. Steve, you know, we hear reference to the problems with males or hermaphrodites in the field. Uh, descri describe what those problems are. One of the biggest problems with having males or hermaphrodites in the field is that they will affect, by cross-pollinating your female plants, they will affect your THC levels and CBD, sometimes negatively. So you want to be scouting early in the season prior to bud initiation in your female plants to make sure there aren't any males and not just walking up to the edge of the field, but actually physically walking through the field. An actual male plant will be growing taller, will have a skinnier growth habit, and you'll see these male flowers that are beginning to become prominent on the plant well before your female plants go into flower. The ones that are more difficult to recognize are what's called hermaphrodite, where it's not truly a full genetic male plant, but it's a plant that usually because of stress and typically from being overwatered, but some environmental stress will cause it to change its mind whether it's gonna be a male or female, and all of a sudden put down these little, people actually call them bananas, looks like a small banana. And when you see those dropping down, usually just underneath the first or second node from the top of the plant, when you see those uh, male flower parts starting to form, then you only have a few days before they start putting pollen out. You should have either an experienced grower or start really looking and researching online before you experience these, because it can happen quite early in the process. Yeah, and I think an important thing to consider here is uh, your your source of your your plant varieties, and you know if if you're if you're using seed um, to to sow your crop, it's important to know where that seed came from. There's traditionally pollinated seed, and then in, in cannabis, there's feminized seed, and I think it's important to uh, to make sure you know you know the difference, and that if if you do uh, have feminized seed that that you know you you're buying from a quality supplier that uh, that that can validate and tell you that for sure it's feminized seed, um, and I think uh, the the challenge with hermaphrodites often comes with the feminized seed. So uh, you know typically when you produce feminized seed, then you have uh, some risk, um, some uh, occurrence of, of hermaphrodites, where it produces some male parts, um, and these occur, you know, anywhere from you know one per one thousand up to one per ten thousand plants in a reasonably um, well-produced feminized seed crop. Um, so, you know, it, 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 but but once again, the only way you're going to spot those is, is going to be with proper scouting, walking your field, uh, and, and knowing your plants and, and taking a good look at it. 
So when you grow from clone, you basically eliminate the risk of, of all that, right? Yeah, the, the risk with clones is much lower because you've got a genetically identical copy of, of a specific plant and you know that it's female. And now that doesn't mean that you can't stress a clone out. I think to Ray's point, you know, um, overwatering, underwatering, changes in light, um, you know, especially, you know, if you're, if you're doing transplants in the early stage of the plant and, you know, getting exposed to too much or too little light at the wrong time can, can lead to, to stress. Any of those factors, um, even pests and disease can lead to stress. Um, those can trigger a plant to produce male parts. But, uh, but in general, what we've seen in, uh, in our plants, both on the feminized seed side as well as on the clone side, is we see a much lower incidence uh, per acre of, of a hermaphrodite in a, in a cloned plant uh, than we do in, uh, in, in feminized seed. So how early and how often should I be scouting my field looking for males? For males, early in the crop cycle is, is, is where you need to start. Uh, you know, the first few weeks that you've planted uh, are generally the safer part of the season. But after the third week after transplant, you should be diligently in the field. And then once you're in the, in the actual flower cycle and you have female flowers showing, uh, even increase the times you walk it to, if you can, you need to be walking daily at that point. And Steve, um, how do I recognize disease? Generally speaking, um, on plants, it could be anything from bacterial to fungal to viral. And with viral symptoms, a lot of times they can look like something else is going on or maybe even nutrient stress. So it's better to get a disease diagnosis from a lab on that. With bacterial and fungal, a lot of times you'll see necrotic spots on the leaves or you'll see the stem uh, starting to darken because the vascular tissue is getting affected. Generally though, I do recommend because some of these diseases look so much alike that you go ahead and get a disease diagnosis as soon as possible. If I'm walking my field, what is it I should be looking for? You're looking for anomalies. You're looking for yellow foliage. You're looking for something that's different. If you see, start seeing leaf spot coming in uh, on the edges or coming in next to an area that has poor airflow, uh, and, you know, sometimes these leaf spot diseases, the plant will outgrow that. So if you start seeing a lot of yellow foliage throughout your crop, then you've, you've had a low fertility for a, a long time. And you should have spotted it much earlier. So you want to try to prevent some of this yellowing early in the crop cycle. And are these problems that typically I'd be able to self-diagnose or does this require like specialized testing in all cases. The state universities and your agriculture universities typically will have pathology labs that are each season now be getting better and better at helping you identify these, these diseases. Uh, and as Steve pointed out a few minutes ago, uh, that, that you can actually send these things off and you should send them off because a lot of these diseases will look similar. Pathology is something that, that we're looking at in our, our research and development division. And for growers that work with us, for our customers, um, you know, we frequently come out and we'll walk the field. And, and uh, I know Steve and, and Ray, you both have, have been out and walked quite a few fields this year. And we'll walk through what's going on with the grower to try and get a better understanding. And we can certainly help diagnose some disease as well. I will tell you, there's a lot of work to do in the pathology um, uh, area around this plant. It's, it's very early. We're still learning what to look for in hemp um, or, or cannabis as a plant in general. And so there's a, a lot of work to do there. And so that's, that's one of the reasons that, uh, that we have the, the pathology group. Part of that as well that I, I should mention is, is, is our clean stock program. You know, one of the things that makes us unique as a nursery in this space is, you know, we've developed the first clean stock program in cannabis. And it's a, a program that's evolving every month, every year, as we learn more and more from the pathology work that we're doing. It's really a quality control system to try and prevent the spread of disease in the plants. You know, there's sustainable, more regenerative approaches to, to managing pest problems and, and weed control. There's a, a lot of good solutions out there, um, you know, that, uh, that you can use and combine those solutions with good preventative practices and you can end up with a, a really healthy, clean crop.